and welcome along to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nicholl. And today on the show, we're talking about a home and income case study. Now, we are joined once again by our friend of the show, Ilsa Wolf, who is going to take us through an example of a property in Hamilton uh, that has been converted into a home and income. So two dwellings out of one. And this is becoming increasingly popular, not just because multi-income properties tend to get a higher yield, but also and I think this is what we're digging into, Elsa. We're going to talk about a property that has been turned from one dwelling into two so that it falls within the new build definition under the interest deductibility changes. So just walk us through. Start with us, uh, Elsa, talking about what was the property before you converted it and, and where is it? All those sorts of things. Great. Well, where I should start really is what the brief was to me from this investor. Uh, she is a, a buy and hold investor already, has a couple of a couple of properties that haven't performed to her expectation from earlier on in her investment journey and she recognized the fact that for her property to grow she really needed to boost the cash flow one of the two properties she already owns is still within Brightline so as a backstop um, you know that could be sold but at a cost so the first option that she's chosen to go down is to really push forward as po- fast as possible with the next project so She enlisted my help um, and what we identified was that we could really significantly increase her passive income through a multi-income acquisition. And so what we found um, on the market at the time, so this is going back to July, uh, where interest rates were around the 2.19%. Oh, the um, good old days. (laughs) <laughs> the good old days. <laughs> she managed to lock in at that, fortunately, which already now is a significant win on the bottom line. Um, so we found a large two-storied dwelling um, on a full-size site in Hamilton. Um, it was an owner-occupied house where um, a sort of 50s couple were living upstairs in a large house that had already had a couple of extensions to that additional floor, sorry, the upper floor uh, previously. So it was relatively modern. That was a bonus because it meant that there was less cosmetic work needed. Um, And then their teenage son was living downstairs in a, not a fully converted downstairs, but they had Um, they had adapted it so that he could live with them but have his own space. Um, On the rental market, as it were, uh, that property would rent for six fifty. dollars The funny thing about that whole sentence, uh, Elsa, is that you showed how much you deal in properties when you refer to them as a 50s couple rather than a couple in their 50s, like you'd say a 50s house. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) So... so, So obviously you got this property. What was the what was the kind of strategy, and and what did you actually do to it? So we needed to manufacture substantially higher income than if this client were to go on the market and find any property and take as is. That was the first thing. Yep. So we recognised the fact that the layout of the house already was quite conducive to a multi-income uh, separation, a uh, multi-dwelling separation. Uh, the natural configuration of the house by being a two-storied uh, main top story for the main dwelling as well as the extra extension and with an internal garage downstairs already hinted to us that uh, there could be some opportunity there and then upon closer look really realised that all of the amenity was there, there was an additional bathroom downstairs, there was a kitchenette downstairs but we'll come back to that later, that was an opportunity in the end Um, and so what we quickly did was in this hot competition was quickly got it under contract, it was a multi-office situation, Um, I suggested to this investor hey let's just go full asking or slightly over, the best plan of attack here is to get the to get this property on contract and then do our due diligence and work backwards. So that's what she did. When you say work backwards, do you mean get a lower price by getting the property under contract, going through da 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 da, and then saying I will confirm, uh, but I need a price reduction of twenty five k? Just walk us through how how that worked in that situation. Yeah, good good question. So the strategy with this one was to, that we did spot substantial opportunity. So the strategy was, first of all, step one, get it under contract. Once we've got it under con- contract, that's that's um, then where the investor and myself could work out a detailed plan. Um, by working backwards, yes, I mean to negotiate down effectively the old Andrew Nickel uh, playbook, which was um, working really well in this market. So uh, <laughs> what we did was, <laughs> upon getting a contract, uh, the investor is Auckland based. This was prior to lockdown, um, but all of the power team uh, are local to Hamilton. I jumped in the car, we got straight down there, all of us on site in sync. Uh, so that's the the agent who found the link, the listing for us, uh, my property manager, my architect, and my builder. We all got to site for one hour, and we walked through, scoped out the plan, 
to be honest, we had about 80% of the plan there. The next step was then for the client to make inroads with the Hamilton District Council, both the planning team from a resource perspective, resource consent perspective, and then the building team to understand physically what could be done to that property and to verify our plan. Um, coming back to the negotiating down, this was where we found a great opportunity where the uh, vendor had converted what should have been shower plumbing downstairs into a kitchenette for their son. So this was great. We got the property on contract for uh, 791000 It's a full site. And then we managed to negotiate down based on the fact that the kitchenette downstairs shouldn't have been there and didn't match the plans. Pulled back by about seven or $8,000, which will now pay for a consented kitchen for my client. So quite a bit of work, Elsa. This is um, you know, not no uh, lick of paint and then uh, just you know, put a bit of stones in the driveway and then rent it out like I would have done. Uh, I'm guessing there's quite a bit of work yet to do with the council there. What was the process there? Yeah, so the first step was to uh, have those initial conversations with the planning team and the building teams to understand what is possible. Um, and that was working, because we were on 14 days due diligence, was to work very closely in parallel the council inquiry along with our architect and builder to understand what would be possible and then also the property manager to verify the rental outcomes that we had scoped. So working closely with the building team to understand what remedial work would be required if my client purchased the property knowing that there wasn't a CCC, sorry, code of compliance for that downstairs kitchenette. We also needed to um, inquire and find out what the building works scope would be knowing that we would be splitting a single property into two dwellings and not just two dwellings but an up-down separation. So the main consideration especially from the council's point of view is this fire what they call fire selling uh, and the idea here is that to protect each uh, residence, each independent tenancy, all of the materials that are effectively a membrane for that downstairs need to hold any potential fire risk for longer than your standard jib or materials. So that's the main consideration that they are worried about. So what kind of things do you do to, to stop that? Uh, so that comes down to mitigating risk. That is, that is really the main risk of a project like this. Um, so I'm working very closely, well, I have worked very closely with the client to make sure that um, the builder and the architect were brought in very early into the process. As well as that, because the downstairs is a concrete base, um, having originally been a basement or garage in its earlier days, we also brought in a drain layer and a plumber very early to understand what the scope of those retrospective works would be. Because mm. when you when you put a dollar, spend a dollar to go backwards, it yeah. makes things twice as expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it is definitely a more complex project. It's one, you can't just fake it till you make it in yep. any way, shape or form. You need to have you're handheld by someone who's gone down that path or bring in all of those specialists that need to help you come to that final conclusion. Well, walk us through the numbers then, you know, because the, I assume that the renovation costs would have been relatively substantial here. So we've already established that uh, the the rent that you thought it would get if you did nothing was about $650 a week. So just walk us through the numbers before, like your purchase price, the rent before renovation, six fifty before you said, and then how much did it cost? What was it worth afterwards? And what rents were you able to achieve? Sure. So it's probably best if I separate the upstairs from the downstairs so that you can separate the original product into its two separate uh, tenancies and we'll go through the numbers that way. So firstly, the original house is around about 180 squares up and down plus one internal garage downstairs. The house as it was presented when we found this listing uh, was appraised at 650 per week. So knowing that there was a partially renovated upstairs, that meant we could budget for less cosmetic work in the overall scope. And that was one factor that gave it a tick. So even though the overall scope was more complex, we knew that there were some uh, ways that we could nudge forward quickly. So what we do, if we separate the upstairs from the down, uh, the upstairs, which was a three bed, one bath, as is, uh, we will now um, actually separate the building consent process into two, with the strategy being to, um, with the pre-settlement access clause that we arranged, we were able to proceed with the architect and drawings to include a fourth bedroom or master suite, so a fourth bed plus en suite and wardrobe, very naturally add that into a huge 50 square meter lounge, um, so the resulting floor upstairs will be one separate dwelling that is four bed, two bath, and where the stairwell previously connected to downstairs, where the laundry was, we could floor over the top and add that laundry back into upstairs. So that upstairs will rent at 650 per week, which was the original appraisal for the entire site. 
And um, that means that the cash flow from the upstairs, keeping in mind that it's still an existing or old dwelling, so not interest deductible after the 27th of March purchase that it is, that will mostly hold the mortgage itself. Meanwhile, we uh, progress the drawings for the building consent downward, uh, downstairs. So the target uh, tenant for to occupy this once done is a professional single or couple that's looking for a high-spec, uh, secure, um, one-bedroom plus study, um, self-contained living with an internal garage as well. Um, that will rent between four seventy-five and five hundred per week. So the renovation budget in totality is around 85000 including the building consent and resource consent fee and the architectural drawings. The reason it's not higher than that, if that's what some listeners or what you're expecting, Ed, is that, like I say, the original layout actually leans itself towards. So downstairs, we've managed to not have to move any load-bearing walls. The core spoke, uh, scope of that work downstairs will be to effectively upgrade all of the supporting walls and linings to fire rated and then paint, curtains, carpet, new kitchen. Now, also, I'm interested to dig into the definitions. Sorry, Andrew, I know you're going to jump in, but I'm interested to dig into the definitions of what you talked about in terms of interest deductibility. Now, I'm wondering whether you got some accounting advice here, because in the original discussion document that came out from the IRD, it said that if you took one dwelling and turned it into two, both would be considered new builds and the interest on those mortgages would both be considered tax deductible. In the second version that came out just last week, uh, it might have been two weeks ago by the time this podcast is released, it wasn't as clear about that. So how you mentioned that you're treating one as interest deductible, the other one is not. So what's the basis for that? Well, actually, no, uh, I leave the client to have any independent advice from their accountant. We didn't specifically look into that together, uh, but we do have a super duper spreadsheet with all my scenarios um, that we look at the best case, the worst case, and know that we're somewhere in, somewhere in between with this you know, new build definition. So um, we know that we can split out one or both dwellings as new build or other. And given the current guidance, we've basically gone on the conservative side to say that based on the interest rate the client already secured early on and based on the outcomes, we have assumed that the upstairs house, just to be conservative, will be considered existing as before. But we know that we are adding an ancillary dwelling, that is the building consent name, and that will be the self-contained per the new def definition. So um, based on that, we're assuming somewhere between a worst case pre-tax cash flow of 25000 per year and wow. a best case of 35000 So we're somewhere around that 30, given that the rents are almost relatively even. That's huge. So so yeah. they, these are big numbers. Is this kind of just a unicorn deal or, or are there many other deals that you think are out there like this? You know, How many other properties can be converted this way, do you think? Yeah, it, I think there are two parts to that question, really. First of all, there's the physical aspect of yes. the site that we're thinking about. So when going out to market, um, every site throws its own set of variables in the mix, both in terms of land size, the zoning rules for that specific site, and then the physical layout and what is offered and the condition of the existing dwelling or dwellings and buildings. The second part, which is actually the bigger challenge than the first, is for the viewer or the potential buyer to spot the opportunity. So um, once you, it's easy to ask questions to council and to the experts and find out whether a, a site or a building can be converted into something more. And when you can manufacture an additional income stream that just gives it so much more guts as far as the cash flow hacking side of things goes. Um, and the second part of that that I mentioned is when you can op when you can spot that opportunity if you can train your eye to see more than what's you know immediately in front of you, that gives you an advantage especially in a multi-office situation or in the current market where you're typically bidding with at least two or three other people any given deal, um, adding those things together um, makes it possible. But it is physically a more uh, resource and time-intensive uh, renovation and value-add project that um, it requires a lot more planning and a lot more expertise. So uh, with this particular deal, it was secured mid mid-July, we made sure that we had pre-settlement access. The settlement only occurred uh, a few weeks ago. We had building plans all set to go and the work began long before the settlement to make sure that we were minimising any downtime. 
And one last question. We've talked about that the rent has increased from about $650 a week to somewhere between $1,100 and $1,150 per week. Now, my question for you, Elsa, is what about the value of the property together? Because this is still going to be two dwellings on one title. Just remind us what you purchased it for, and then we'll add on the 85k in terms of renovation costs and talk about, well, what was the value uplift we got from conducting these renovations? After negotiating down, uh, the end purchase price was 785000 The renovation cost eighty five. That included development contributions as well of four thousand, which was great. So eight seventy. So the final price of the contract, once we'd negotiated down, was seven hundred and eighty-five thousand, and then the renovation was eighty-five thousand. Um, now the key part of the borough strategy and being able to forecast that equity uplift is as important as the cash flow hacking, of course. So um, there's been a ton of activity across Hamilton. It's a very hot market, a lot of sales, a lot of new builds as well. Um, so the what we did was check with several real estate agents um, from all of the big brands across Hamilton. Well, my client was very proactive with that. She called around and requested comps on the sales of what we're actually sale, selling as home and incomes. Wow. So what we found was that all home and incomes were selling for between 1.1 and 1.2. So she's made a steady 250 or so K. That's awesome. Just like that. Great. Yeah, plus the cash flow of a minimum 25K positive per annum. That's great result. Well, I tell you what, let's wrap it up there, but please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really does help us get the message out to more people. And hey, if you're thinking, God, this is pretty good. I wouldn't mind getting some advice and, and working with Ilsa to do some of this stuff. Then you might like to check out the Opus Accelerate service. So this is the actual service that Ilsa runs that she's kind of described in this specific case study. Um, so I'm going to drop a link to that in the show notes. Tap or swipe over the cover art. I'm going to drop a link in there. Or just go to opuspartners.co.nz slash accelerate. Thanks for listening to the Property Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Ian McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nicholl. And we're going to be back again tomorrow with even more daily strategies, tactics and insights to help you get the most of New Zealand property market. Until next time, 